Hello. How's the mute, isn't it? <laughs> the first two were obviously very keen. Yeah, we've had a few sign up since this morning as well, actually. So we're up to about, I think, 29. Um, Heather's joining as well, actually, which is good. Okay, cool. So that'll be good. So, yeah, I think we're. I'll ruin that one. <laughs> I think we're pretty much covered. Well, it's a bit late if we've got anything still to do now, Russell. So. <laughs> True that. Very I can good. make it up. Um, do feel free that if I'm taking, give me kind of a five minute prod by any media. Yes. I just did a timing of it. It took me 35 minutes. No worries. Cool. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you a kind of five minute warning um, after yeah. 20, 25 minutes. Um, yes, that'll be good because I'll have my clock going. But, um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I presume we'll be a few minutes late in starting anyway, as usual, just when by the time people get logged in. But the link works. That's it. That's the <laughs> that's a good thing. Yes. It was hard to find. I had to go back to my email to find it. Yeah. It on the site. So anyone who's joined today might struggle. So I don't know if it's worthwhile sending it out again now. I, I might pop it on the actual group just now then. Um, in fact, yeah, I'll send it to, to everyone again it's, just now. Um, just, yeah, just send it to anyone who's signed up. So that's, that's a good thing point yeah um, I, I went into the meetup.com couldn't find it on there had to go into the actual email you sent yesterday to find it yeah and if no one had got that email they won't be able to join or i couldn't figure out a way and i'm i'm a host I post it to the meet the meetup group board as well. Mm. Is it a disposable link? As in, it'll only work for this one event. It'll only work for this one event. Yeah. Then yeah. Cool. Because if they're in the meetup and they bomb us, then we got rid of them. We learn fast and we fail fast. Yeah. And on the other hand, there's a host to be able to kick them out. There's only 89 people this morning. A lot of them have been vetted as people that we know. Yeah. Okay, this is recording as well. It is, yes. Right, I've reset that now. Hopefully. There you go, sharing the screen as well. Yep, Open. got it. Cool. I actually realised, you know, when it comes to things like sharing the screen, um, you have, so I had a Coro pad this morning, and when I set this, this link up, I put in my settings that only hosts and co-hosts can share the screen, but it's an overriding function as opposed to on a case by case basis. So I had to send it on a link for a coder pad because Kate can't, I <laughs> couldn't share the screen. So something for me to be mindful of, I think. For some reason you can't set it on a kind of meeting by meeting basis. Yeah. I, I dare say there's a more professional platform out there for it, but. <laughs> Probably. That's good. Yeah, here we go. Congratulations, Nathan. You win the award for one time. <laughs> 
Oh, I'll get the trophy made. Yep. It'll be delayed in the first one. Welcome one and all, we're just waiting for a few more attendees before we do anything. Hello. Hello, welcome. Just waiting for a few more people. It's too sunny a lunchtime. I think everyone's going to go and have a sit outside and drink a beer and uh, eat a sandwich. I think we'll give it another two or three minutes. A few still to join. Hi, Russell. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi, Ron. Um, sorry, my camera doesn't seem to be working. I'll have to raise a ticket for that. It's all right. This is probably where we need hold music, isn't it, really? Elevated music. I could 
possibly find some smooth jams on Spotify, Russell, to <laughs> appease the crowd for five minutes. Oh, so when we're going to start? Should we just start and let anyone who joins late? Yeah, I can just admit. Yeah, I, th I think so. I can just admit people as we go. Um, there's a few kind of latecomers have just RSVP'd, but the yeah, the links in the in the group anyway. So um, so yeah, shall we shall we crack on? Yeah, I think so. So um, yeah, so firstly, obviously, um, welcome to to We Are Tech. Um, really great to see everyone here. I know there's a few people joining as well. So um, yeah, always a big um, a big thanks to, to our sponsors, the Geezer as well, who are, who are helping us put this this meet up out there. So um, I think just a little bit about ourselves and, and kind of what we're looking to achieve as a meetup. So we, I think first and foremost foremost we are looking to really cover a broad range of uh, of tech topics if you look at the up and coming um meetups and events that we have um you'll see it's, it's really quite diverse uh we're based out of the northeast but we're really open to anyone across the uk and indeed further afield who uh, wants to come and join us again being based online at the moment and that, that really does help facilitate that um of course we'll be looking at doing some some more local events at some point um, COVID permitting, but um, you know, again, equally, I think we'll, we'll be keen to keep the, the online events up and running as well, just to include as many people as possible. Um, I, I think kind of important to note as well that we're really, really keen to have people's input. So if there's a topic that um, you're passionate about, you'd like to hear discussed, do feel free to contact us over the, the meetup page and make suggestions equally if you would like to speak on something. Again, do get involved and um, we'll do our best to facilitate that. So, yeah, on to yeah, the agenda for today. So, yeah, we've had the in intro to We Are Tech. Um, obviously, today's topic is going to be shift left, shift right testing. Um, Russell Cracksford, who's the yeah, head of test uh, with Segeza is going to be speaking. So we've planned that in for roughly about 30 minutes. Um, thereafter, we'll have kind of 50, maybe 20 minutes Q&A. Um, what I would say is if you do have any questions, do write them in the comments box and um, I'll put them to Russell once we've finished. And then quite simply, we'll close up um, any comments you may have as well um, surrounding the group. We can we can answer those. And uh, yeah, it'd be good to give everyone a, a Kind of brief overview of the upcoming events that we have over the next yeah six to eight weeks. So yeah, I think without further ado, it's uh, it's over to the man and the woman, Russell. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. So shifting, testing, left and right. That's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so a little bit about me first. So as mentioned, I currently work for Skaser. I'm the head of quality management there. Uh, you can reach me on email, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Um, I'm a bit of a, a dogophobe. Well, dogophobe is not the right word. I've got a dog at the moment. Love a dog. I'm spending a lot of my time training a puppy. Um, if I'm not doing that, I'm out on my bike or I'm building a kit car. That's a picture of my old kit car, which I wrote off. And I'm building a new one of those. Hopefully, it's coming in August to start building it. When I'm not having fun on bikes and cars, I'm involved in um, recording a podcast called Testing Peers with three other testers. I also like to get involved in meetup communities, uh, this meetup, uh, but also kind of the Ministry of Testing Newcastle I'm involved with helping organize that and testing folks, which is there to help people get into testing. Uh, both of those two are on hiatus for COVID um, because they work better as local meetups and people in person. Outside of that, I've worked in the past for sort of NCFE, Education Charity, um, AXA Insurance, SAGE, Big Northeast Employer, Scott Logic, um, and obviously, as I said, now in Skazer. So, a little bit about what we're going to do today. So, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the terms of shift left, shift right, um, and why they're kind of branded around improved quality. We talk about what they mean, um, why it kind of matters a little bit. Um, and how to go about it. So I'm going to try and give you some examples from my own world where I can, but talk about the wider concepts as well. Um, and we'll hopefully kind of ask some questions at the end, which might help tailor a few problem solving exercises. That's the aim. Um, so 
Um, first of all, I'm going to start by defining something. So a little bit about what we mean by testing. So we're talking about shifting testing. First, we need to have a common understanding of testing. So to me, testing is a process of investigation. It's there to aid the understanding of software quality, help reduce the risk of software failure. So we don't want it to go kaboom. So it's investigation. It is more than simply verification. I think it's a requirement. It's more than exploring it, see if there's anything hidden behind the scenes. It's the act of questioning, reviewing, monitoring, assessing, merging, reporting, communicating, discussing, all these sorts of things together to help build what testing actually really is. So what does that mean in terms of talk about shifting? So on the right there, you'll see kind of a common um, view of what a software delivery lifecycle might be, generally a waterfall or a remodel version. There's variations that you end up with kind of having requirements, design, implementation, development, that then feed into test and into maintain. So that's kind of a traditional model that came out in the 70s, and it's kind of a way in which we deem things to work. You'll often find the model still there. Even in some teams in Agile, you're finding that that is quite sort of processed and it follows linearly to that maintain at the end. Now, when we talk about shifting, so you can see that in the majority of the testing effort generally happens in this sort of model, the test phase at the end. Now, when we talk about shifting, we're talking about shifting that big green blob from sort of center right, kind of left or right. But I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go. Um, so why? Why do we kind of want to shift left, first of all? Let's cover that one. So we want to narrow the gap between the tests and the requirements. It's a way to make sure that we fix and find or prevent, maybe it's the best word, issues early. So we make sure that we don't miss requirements. We can make sure that the experience is as good as it can be. We can find performance issues. We can make sure that security risks and things are mitigated. We can make sure we build the right thing. Now, having um, narrowing the gap from uh, the left, so testing earlier, it's not a new concept. Originally, before uh, Waterfall came in, it was very common for developers to test code. Be much more testing done earlier on in the process. It is only kind of with the advent of Waterfall that it's actually become much more of a linear flow. So it's not historically uncommon, it is just more recently uncommon. So that is more what a shift left model would end up looking like. We'll talk about the pros and cons of that as well. What we're going to try and do is talk about what it would take in order to try and generate that shift. So I'll start with a quote from Michael Jordan. So talent wins games, can't say it. Talent wins games. Teamwork and intelligent wins championships. So you can have a great um, analysis. You can have a great um, implementation. You can have a great maintenance. But unless all aspects of that flow are great, you're not going to win. You're not going to have a quality product at the end of it. So you need your whole team to be working together. Shifting left is a requirement that you have a lot of teamwork. It is not one person that shifts left. It's generally a team that shifts left. To do so, you've got to break the silos. We all have our skills, and they should all be appreciative of what they are. You know, some of us are leaders. We can lead people, set direction, strategy. Some of us are developers who write exceptional code. Some of us look at the user experience and look at what we can do there. Some of us retain systems in production, test it, and so on. If we work together, and we actually help and support each other, so we share our knowledge from each of our areas, that can make sure that our, what we build, what we design, what we implement is a higher quality product because our ops people are telling us what would make it easier to maintain in production. Our developers are telling us what would make it easier to develop or how easy it would be to do this with the UX. If we work in silos and pass things off, it gets much harder. So we have to try and break down those silos. And that's not easy. So to do that, we ultimately need to work with one team. And there's different ways of doing that, and there's many ways of doing it. And it all depends on the context of where you are. So I'll start with the context of testing, really. In the context of testing and quality, then getting involved in day one is kind of the first starting point. So that's if you're a leader, assigning testers to projects, giving them time and space to work on that project, to understand the context. So where I've worked in the past, for example, Sage, one of the things we try and do is make sure that any new project that was kicked off, we've got someone along from testing early into the discussions, 
to sit in, to understand, to hear, to get that context. You know, they spotted questions and things that help make sure that design was better. Um, it doesn't just apply to testing. It can apply to developers, it can apply to ops. The earlier you can get them in talking together, the more fundamental big things they can spot and the more they can shape the direction. The next area there is kind of the architecture. And I think in shifting left, architecture becomes quite a critical factor in it. So when you're building the architecture for what you want as your application and production and test and dev, you need to bear in mind the leaseability of that, the maintainability of it, the deployability of it, testability of it. So you've got to work with your architects, you've got to work with your designers, your developers, anywhere you are, in order to make sure that what you're building is testable. So it could be making sure UI elements have identifiable assets, things like that. It can be to make sure the build pipeline incorporates different things. You need to work with your architects to think of a strategy that goes with the architectural structure. So classically right now, there's a big shift toward microservices. That's been for one. The testing strategy, how you test that and shift left, different to what if you're testing a model. How you move there is different. So you need to work together as one. So if you go to those meetings, if you go into those sessions, and you show an interest in what we're doing, you ask questions, you be a positive force and asking them how we could do this, rather than being a blocker. You know, don't go in there saying, we can't do that, we can't test like that. Go in there and ask the questions of how and what, so naturally you'll get more insight engagement and people working on it. Beyond that, there's things you can do with tools. So in this context, I'm not going to talk about the different tools you can use, but it's more, if you want to work as one team, sharing tools, access to tools, platforms you use. So if you're putting, for example, requirements in Jira, then guess what? Testing things should be in Jira too. If you're putting code into GitHub, then probably any automation check should be in GitHub too. So the patterns and the technology you use, try and share where it makes sense. It doesn't always make sense. You know, you can't, uh, you could use GitHub as a document repository if you want. It doesn't always make sense to do the same tools just for the sake of it. If you can align them, it makes communication much easier. And sharing Jira links versus sharing access to a different tool in a different place where your test cases are, for example. The other one is about, Communication. So you've got to share, you've got to talk, you've got to pair. And that can be testers with testers, it can be developers with testers, it can be developers with business analysts. It's about working together and communicating. So that's at desk demos, it's debriefing what you're changing and why, talking through your design, it's sketching up something. It's kind of a rough design and kind of showing it to somebody else and saying, are we on the same page? It's those sort of things that drive communication across teams. Um, I would be an advocate of obviously mobbing um, and sample testing, pairing. It doesn't just work um, in the same discipline, it can work across. It's a great way of cross skilling. So if you've got a new person on your team, not familiar with your code base, then you know, doing an ensemble sort of event or mobbing event where someone drives it, someone navigates it, someone controls who's doing what, that can help cross skill and you learn how to merge the code to bring unit tests. It helps build a bond. You all start learning how each other's work. So it's a good approach. Use that a little bit before and stage as well. So risk storming. So many of you may not have heard of risk storming. Um, it's an idea and it's like a deck of cards brought on our website. Um, this is something you can buy or purchase a deck from Ministry of Testing. And risk storming is a way of looking at what quality aspects of the team you value. So do you value compatibility? Do you value uh, interoperability? Do you value um, whatever characteristic you want, and then looking at those characteristics you as a team value, prioritize them, and then looking at how you mitigate those. How do you plan in verification, checks, exploration, different techniques and tools to mitigate those risks? You do it as a team. So in essence, you're helping to build a test strategy as a team as you're working together to mitigate those risks. So yeah, those are some of the things you can do to do it. But there's kind of some of the big ones, and we'll come across them separately because it doesn't address the build the right thing. So many of you will probably have seen this diagram before. So how someone explains it, how a project leader understands it, what someone designs, what someone writes, and what someone really wanted. And it's still common. This diagram in basic form was actually written again in the 70s. So the same problems we faced in the 70s we're facing today. You know, was it 50 years on? It's got similar problems. 
So some things have come out to try and help do that. Um, shifting left is kind of one of them. Some of the techniques and things that come out of shifting left is the other one. So we mentioned one of them a little bit already, which was kind of drawing things, mocking things, displaying things. Wireframes, classic example of that. But a whiteboard can be equally as good. A bit harder in COVID times to get around a whiteboard, but there are still tools like Jamboard and um, other tools out there where you can draw things and sketch things, etc. get visual ideas. But much better to do a sketch or something quickly than it is to kind of spend um, a week designing a web page and finding out it's a bit wonky. So it's a good idea to kind of get those things done early and do it with testers, developers, designers involved. And actually you might find the designer needs it, UX people might need it. And that's great. It's the, the act of working together is what's building the quality. So three amigos. Um, sorry for the bad film reference. Some of you may not have been born when this film came out. But for those of you who have, um, it's a concept if you've got three different representatives. So the film doesn't really represent this very well, but the concept is that you have someone from a business perspective, someone from a development delivery perspective, and someone from a testing perspective. And you discuss requirements in kind of refinement sessions and other things in order to make sure you're all on the same page. Again, the point of it is to make sure you build the right thing early. And any mis miscommunications, misunderstandings are nailed before it actually goes into the more expensive you built it. So as a tester, I want to prevent bugs. I don't want to find bugs. If I can put more work into preventing them, I'm a happy bunny. I don't want to be measured by finding bugs. I want to be measured by preventing them. Fortunately, it's a hard measurement to measure. That leads on to another common approach that helps you shift left. So this is called Behavioral Driven Development, BDD, you might have heard it as. And it was invented by, well, inventors, possibly not the right word, but it was started off and encouraged by someone called Dan North. I think actually he's not from not far from Sunderland. I think he's actually from um, South Shields, as it happens. Um, and he invented this when he was working for ThoughtWorks uh, back in 2006. And it's a, it kind of borrows from TDD and borrows from domain driven language. But it's again, like the three amigos, working together to define behaviors of a system. So in this case, you define the behavior. So, given a certain situation, when X event happens, then this is the outcome. And it created a domain language so that people can use the same language to describe what's going on. And it means that your business people, your developers and testers, can communicate on one page. And by just that communication alone, and by having this as an outcome that people can review, it helps building quality early. And that means you build the right thing. Now, BDD then goes on to looking at frameworks that you can actually use to automate these. You can automate them at different levels. I'll come on to that a little bit later. So BDD is definitely a very common tool, common way of shifting left right now. So if you can build the right thing, it's great. Just because you're using the tool or the syntax doesn't mean you're doing BDD. BDD is all about that conversation at the start to make sure you're building the right thing. So we used it in Sage um, for when we're doing new API products. So we started writing them, we had testers write them, we got developers to review them, and we got VAs and analysis to kind of read them. Wasn't ideal. I'd love to have them all in the meeting together. We didn't always achieve that. So we did the best we could. And a lot of shift left is about improving what you're doing, not necessarily being perfect. So moving on, I'm going to talk about the other side of shift left. So from working as one, we need to understand and we need to learn. So quote from Henry Ford, we did quite well, I think. Failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. So failure is it's basically an opportunity to learn. And shift left is talking about learning fast. So we want to know about the product fast. We want to know, is it the right thing? We want to learn fast and be fast. So I've crossed out fail there for a reason. I think failure is a dodgy word because it has connotations in lots of cultures. No one really wants to fail. We talk about fail fast. People are very positive about learning fast, not so much about failing fast. So I personally lean towards talking about learning fast failing fast because it's very hard to get over that sort of uh, in, inner bias towards what failure means but it's ultimately we're talking about the same thing you need to learn when things don't go right and improve so how do we do that in the shift left concept we talk about layered approaches we talk about using the right techniques for the right risks which, you know which should automate the right tests in the right place and then use the right tools Automation is one of the big things that's pushed a lot in shift left, and automation is important. 
Um, it is not the all handle, but it is certainly an important part of it. You can shift left slightly without automating. You probably can't go fully left without a lot of automation. But it all depends on the context of where you are. So from the top right and corner there, you've got what is not far off the traditional testing pyramid or triangle. You've got unit tests at the bottom, some integration, some service level tests in the middle, and a few user end to end tests at the top. Most of us might be familiar with this and seen it for a while in different forms. And that concept is good and it works in some approaches. But we're also learning that that testing pyramid is evolving. So for microservices, you might have um, less service level tests and actually have more unit tests. You might change the approach. So be conscious that just because you see something doesn't mean it's right. You have to challenge it and work towards what's best. Um, use the right approaches. So if you don't have unit testing, by adding in unit testing, you're actually starting to shift left. Um, classic example would be, I worked for um, a business a while ago and they did lots of user end-to-end -end tests and they did lots of unit testing. Testers never spoke to developers and what was unit tested and vice versa. And there was nothing done at the service level, nothing done in between at all. But once you got into it, you found out it was because they hadn't actually really written service level and it was kind of embedded into the rest of the code and partly tested and unit tested. It wasn't very clear. It's a bit of an amalgamation. So what we did, we started refactoring. So when new things came in, we started to separate out that layer to make it easier to test. When we were building new applications, we made it cleaner. And when I say we, it's the team, the developers, the testers, the architects have to go along with this. That meant that we built service level tests that actually meant we started cutting down our user end-to-end -end tests. So we started to make it much more pyramid-like. And you know, that was a slow winding way to get there. And if we we're building a new application from scratch, we wouldn't make that mistake again. But because we had one that already existed, we had to adapt. So we had to find the right way of doing it in our context. The bottom diagram there is a pipeline and the very various forms of it. You'll notice on the left-hand side, there are a lot more blue blobs than on the right-hand side. And that's because actually in there, you've got the coding, you've got unit testing, you've got component testing, you've got verifying contracts, you've got um, writing performance checks, you've got exploratory, you've got lots of things locally. If you're building a new pipeline, the more you can build the left to start with, the more left you've started, and the find faster you'll find issues. So you can design things to do that as well. But if you have to move from one to the other, from a kind of a, a traditional model, the more left, pick your battles. So if you don't have unit testing, that's a great one to start with. You don't have user end-to-end -end tests, perhaps you start there. But pick the one that will start having an impact and iterate. Pick the right tools, I mentioned before, share them if you can. Don't build an automation framework in a completely bespoke language that no one can ever do. Use the tool that works for your team. So moving on, other areas of kind of what you can do. So those pyramids and other things often covered mainly functional tests. There's a lot more to testing than functional tests. So a couple of clips here from Sonar Cube, which is a static analysis tool. Static analysis is quite an important tool to shift left. So you can use it to make sure the syntax is right, make sure you're using it in the right same way, that you're consistent with language and how you write code. That helps you maintain the application best. It means that people coming in have a consistent approach to look at things. That means you reduce errors or making wrong patterns and things like that. So you can use static analysis to do that. You can also use static analysis to do analysis of releasability, reliability, security, maintainability, um, and lots of other areas. And static analysis is another thing you can put in your pipeline. You can put that in earlier and you can monitor it and you can make sure things don't get worse. It takes much more of a concerted effort to improve it. So on that diagram, the bottom left, you'll see releasability is a C with .NET team. So that will take more effort to improve that from a C to a B. You can make sure it doesn't go down to a D. And this is where you start putting processes in that you can learn and improve. Okay, so the other thing I put on here is TDD. So it's a development process. And I'm going to be honest and say I've never met a team that's doing TDD. They are generally not doing TDD. They generally write unit tests. They don't write the fail tests first and so on. So I think TDD is a great approach and helps write high quality code. I've never seen it in life. So that's why I'm not. And uh, but again, I said two things. So on here, there's an image of Jenkins, bottom right corner. So Jenkins is just an example of a continuous integration. So that's where the static analysis can be run. You can trigger off automation tests. You can 
make sure that things you would do manually can be automated so that you can save effort, energy, like that. And you can also put notifications into systems so that those notifications trigger events. Um, so it could be the test results. It could be the build failed so that people see things in the places that they use. So they learn about failure faster. They can respond faster. Okay. Um, so I've used, for example, um, Zap as a tool to put into um, a pipeline to make sure that we have performance tests, uh, not performance tests, sorry, security tests and vulnerability scanning. But we didn't do that daily. We started off that once a month and then we make it more frequently. So it's all often it's about iterative improvements. If we don't have something, running it once a month is better than running it never. Running it once a week, better than running it once a month, and so on. Okay. Just briefly then, shifting left is what we focus on so far. So the tips I would leave you with for there is, as a leader, someone working on it, share what your philosophy is, share your vision, share why you want to shift left. Find advocates across different teams, different disciplines, and work with them. People that are advocates will help you drive to success. You will always fail sometimes. You know, always ask the question of how could we figure this out earlier? How could we have caught this earlier? It's not who went wrong, what went wrong, how could we have caught this earlier? Don't forget that no tools or techniques can solve things alone. You need people to use things correctly to solve them. I mentioned TDD. It's talked about a lot in places I've worked in the past. We've generally not been using it and we just be doing unit testing. It's a different thing, it has a different impact on code. So you've got to make sure you use things correctly if you want to use them. Careful what you say you're doing, you're not doing it. BDD is another thing. Don't forget to explore. So BDD and all these other things, you can prepare and make sure you're on the same page, but there's always going to be things that are beyond what you can predict. So using exploratory testing is a great technique to go beyond what you can predict and use what you learn to improve, to improve your automation, to improve your checks, improve things. Finally, treat your coded tests as you would any other code. So make sure it's maintainable, make sure it's the same standards as other stuff. It is, in reality, what allows you to release to production. So you've got to treat it as such. If it's flaky, fix it. It's not something you can leave to later, it's something you've got to attack now. Because that just gets worse. And that technical debt grows, and it gets to the point where you can't release, which is not so good. So that's left. So let's go right. So if left is all about testing and requirements phase, then right, logically, is between operation, the maintaining of it, and the testing phase. So as testers, uh, many of you may be, you'll know that test environments aren't great for testing. Um, they never really mir mirror production, and they generally aren't production users. You are a tester. So you're biased by your testing experience and your knowledge. You don't use it as a user would. It's quite hard. So the best way to get that information is by actually testing in production. There's different ways of doing that, different things you can do. But let's move on to that. He says, there we go. So Mark Zuckerberger says about production and things. So he listens to what users want, find out what you should build, but he also uses uh, qualitative and quantitative measures to see what they're doing and behaving. And that's what shifting right is about. So one model is feature flags. Um, so that allows you to put code in production actually behind a flag that you can toggle it on and have a look at how it works or behaves. You can use operational flags. So you can put, for example, postcode services or other services behind a flag and turn it off. So we've done that in, um, again, I'll say you say as an example, where we actually put a new feature behind a flag, but actually we found a performance issue, so we turned it off again. We we're able to control it. We've also done experiments. So this takes us into A-B testing. You might have heard of. So you might want to see what a new user flow works, how it works. You might want to see what conversion rate is, sign up rates by changing text. So again, we used we used a tool called Pendo, I think, to do this quite quickly, but you can actually do it in the UI itself, often in some applications, the way you construct it. And you can measure the actual conversion rates, success rates. You can then see which route works best. That is production testing. That is allowing people to see which paths work best. That's shifting right. The other things that's quite common within the shifting right models is kind of monitoring and observability. So just very briefly, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. I've listed a few on the right that you can use to help you monitor application. Um, but you need to make your application observable. So we can monitor errors, we can monitor site traffic, we can monitor the user flows, the events, we can monitor queues, we can put health endpoints into services and ping them and see what happens. We can monitor our servers, CPU, the memory, the database. 
but we have to make it observable to do so. And sometimes that's part of our design process, you know, shifting right and left at the same time. There's concepts that you can do. I've never done this one myself, where you actually can run automated checks against production continuously. So this is where you might run um, a sign-up flow constantly to make sure your sign-up flow is never broken. You might run it every minute. Just make sure it doesn't go down because that's where your money is. So those are things normally done when systems are at scale um, or when there's a massive revenue loss. So imagine if your cart failed in Amazon um, and you couldn't purchase anything. You'd want to know about that instantly because millions and millions you'll be losing every second it's broken. Um, the other one that I've done actually within teams is we actually have feedback channels. So, you know, sometimes in applications you have feedback requests. We put that, so it actually went straight into Slack and went, minus any personal data, went to our teams. So you could see your service, what the feedback was. So the delivery teams would fix bugs or they were even raised by anybody else just because they saw some feedback, knew it was easy to do, and just do it. So they, because they were observing what the users were doing, they were making changes based upon it. So that feedback was about as fast as possible. They heard the customer and they'll do it. So the final thing is canarying. So this is a way of learning about production systems. So testing in production and testing using traffic. So you can actually turn on a feature that's behind a flag to a different set of people. Um, so you might start with 10% of your traffic going to a service to see how it's used and it's useful and people enjoy it more. You might look at performance issues that allows you to do less performance testing earlier. You might look for compatibility issues and so on. Um, and you can increase the traffic, increase the traffic. And you generally do that in chunks. You don't go 10, 100. You generally kind of double it uh, every time sort of thing. Um, and that can teach you about kind of what the users are doing, what behavior is, is it working, is it not? And it allows you to control it. If you control it in this way, you can also turn it off. So if it causes a problem, you can reduce that traffic. But it's a way to roll things out, to do feedback and roll things back. Safely. So I've talked a lot quite fast, so apologies for that. But if you're shifting left and shifting right, using some of these techniques, some of these tools, some of these ideas, where do you end up? Well, you end up in something which is not a blob, a green blob. You end up with a team working together as one. Well. You end up with testing throughout the entire system done by the whole team. And you end up with something much more like this. So the testing presentation is never complete about a diagram by Dan Ashby. Um, so this is that. Um, so this is a DevOps model, or a form of it, that's pointing out that actually you can test the branch of code, the code itself, the merging, the building, the releasing, the deployment, the operations, the monitoring, and the plan you've got. You can test throughout the entire life cycle. And different people be skilled in different bits in different ways. You can cross-pollinate ideas, skills, and actually as a whole team, you start doing what is called continuous testing. And that allows you to make sure that the application you're building is about as efficient as it can be, preventing defects or issues. So I'm going to leave you with that concept of continuous testing. So that's what you get. You should have left and right. Hand back over to my hand. For questions. Indeed, thanks very much for that, Russell. Um, so yeah, I've obviously popped in the chat there if anyone's got any questions. Do, um, do put them in the chat box. There's nothing so far. So I don't know if anyone wants to, yeah. Ah, hold uh, on. Yeah, we've, got, um, we've got one now. Yeah, I did have a question. So yeah, I'm a test that I work at, um, for Sky. Um, okay. And um, I'm sort of interested in, um, like been looking into security testing and how you can um, sort mm -hmm. of in CD. I was wondering, you did mention it, so I was wondering what, a little bit, if you could tell me a little bit about that tool and how you sort of used it, if that's okay. Sure. So um, one of the tools we used in the past was called Zap. So it's a OWASP tool, it's um, freeware um, created by OWASP um, and it's a vulnerability scanner. So you can use it for different things, but what we would do is run it against uh, a build and tests and make sure that there's any vulnerabilities and it would come back with a list of risks and vulnerabilities potentially in our application from actually using the application. So use the end-to-end -end test to do it. But there's other tools out there and I can't pronounce them, so I'm going to apologize, but something called um, Sync, Sneak, S-Y-N-K. That's things that you can put into the build cycles that are quite common, that they look for vulnerabilities and, and depending on which version you get, they can look for vulnerabilities in open source, they can look for vulnerabilities in your coding. Um, I use Breakman Pro, I think when we were working with Ruby on Rails. So there's lots of different tools out there 
for different tech stacks. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, catch up later if you want to go into any more. Uh, Canals asked a question as well. So biggest challenge facing ship like it's biggest challenge is often getting people to work together as one team and realizing that it's continuous and it's a culture. So it's easier to tell someone to use a tool. It's very hard to shift a culture to kind of working together as one, seeing how that value is. So that's the biggest challenge. And it's easier to take people with you than it is to tell people to work as one. So it's kind of, you know, I mentioned risk storming as an example earlier. Um, three amigos, getting people to see the value by doing it is often the best kind of approach to kind of tackle that. Um, yeah. Okay, how do you just, just shift right to large scale organizations? Um, lot of I guess it depends which parts of shift right you want to introduce. Um, so like most things, it's iterative. Um, so for example, monitoring and things like that, you'll probably find that your ops teams are doing it regardless. So being able to sit with them, work with them to figure out what monitoring of other behaviors could be added, what tools can do, what you can add be done with little investment or resource, just a bit of time, um, show the value, um, A, B, testing, feature flags, things like that. They're harder because there are architectural changes. You need to change how you deliver code. Um, and that's generally based best on talking about the risks. So if you're building a whole new website, for example, that's something that's possibly better to do A, B than, um, than just Big Bang. So you go to talk about the risks and you can frame it as a risk and what risk you're trying to mitigate to get a better chance. But you've got to also be in early. So they're six months into a project. Changing it is often hard. Uh, maybe so, I should uh, also um, explain a little bit of the context. Sure. So a large organization normally has a lot of department and uh, they split into the process into this team that team and the team doesn't really talk to each other so the way is actually trying to get management to try to introduce the change and the resources how to talk to the management uh, i understand that from the risk uh, okay. part of that but how to introduce more value to in to to uh, convince the management there is more value into it rather than the risks Sure. So is the management stopping you talking to the other departments? Or is the management not, but just departments don't speak naturally? I think the department doesn't really speak with each other. Okay. So I'd start by tackling that, if I'm honest, and I'd start having conversations. So I, I would be speaking to people in ops, people in development, people in architecture. I'd be taking them out for coffee if I could. It's not right now. Um, having virtual hangouts with them talking about what their problems are, what their challenges are, finding out how together you can help challenge them. And then coming back with an idea um, to your managers and others saying, look, if we work together, we can do this. And that's kind of the way I tackle it. Because you're right, big organizations have leaders. Um, and most organizations have people that kind of want to frame things in their own structure, they have their own plan. So you need to start breaking down those walls. And you can probably do that actually at a lower level than the managers can. Um, so if you start leading by example, you'll often kind of do that. Um, and you start a groundswell. So that's kind of what I would do. So lead the cultural change by being the cultural change. Mm -hmm. So normally engage with a, transform a transformation lead or that kind of a group. I've, yeah. I've worked with transformation groups in the past. Um, I've worked with those sort of organizational structures where someone comes in to try and transform things. Um, they're mixed results is the honest answer. Um, I find the best results I've had is like um, different departments talking to each other, sharing things, um, communities of practice, um, not forced ones, but ones where actually, for example, this talk, um, you might give it and you might talk to someone about what testing could do left. And that gives an idea to a developer that goes, oh, we can involve you here. So I just start talking, mm -hmm. I talk a lot. Um, but just sharing those ideas and those practices, and sometimes they'll click and then just latch on to that click and kind of then progress it. So you get your claws in there and kind of grow it. Yeah, yeah, it's always a difficult problem, but thanks for your insight. Yeah, it is.
Um, Graham's asked one there. Um, are there more or less challenges when applying shift right in reactive agile rather than waterfall model? I'm not sure what reactive agile is, if I'm honest. Um, but there's always challenges to shift right because you have to start building things differently and you have to start addressing problems differently and you end up with complexity in terms of managing toggles and managing production. Um, and everyone thinks production is sacred. And it, if you kind of build your process, you can fail fast. You can start reducing that sacredness. You can start putting top features out with 10% user bases. Again, you can break this concept. But it is hard to go over that first hurdle. Um, I would say waterfall model in general is challenging because waterfall often implies silo. And when you want to do some of these things, you do need to work as a team. The tester has to work with your developer, work with your architects. So I would say definitely shift right is more challenging in a waterfall model than agile. Agile, you're meant to be measuring done. You're meant to be measuring code is complete. Um, you're meant to be working as one team. Um, the one that always got to me is in agile, there isn't a dev and an ops team. The concept doesn't exist. That's something that we've inserted into our applications and the way we work. Agile is very much more about kind of customer development, done, delivery. We've put some of these sort of hurdles and processes in place. So if we can think differently, perhaps we can get rid of the concept. Um, even with DevOps, let's face it, how many teams have developers and ops people called DevOps? It's not the same thing. You need ops people and devs to be working together on, on par. That's DevOps. That's hard. Anyone got anything else? Um, <laughs> sorry, maybe I have okay. one quick question. Uh, in your slide, you just mentioned the TDD. When I yes. talk to TDD to develop a tester, I always got this, uh, uh, let's say, double understanding of what it exactly is. Is a, is a design tools for developer or is that actually useful for testing? What is uh, your opinion on that? So it's useful for building quality code. That serves a purpose and it's designed better. So it's useful because it builds quality into the application. So generally you're writing higher quality things, you find out whether it's failing fast, you build unit testing into your workflow. I think I, I'm kind of, what's the best way of phrasing it? My view of quality and testing is it's everyone's responsibility. So there's a lot of crossover between who does what and things. Most places I've worked, developers do TDD uh, or do unit testing, not testers. Um, but I'm all for collaboration to make things better. As I said at the start, I don't think many teams actually do TDD. I think most of them like unit tests. It's very different. I think writing TDD is very hard, which is, I think, why people have shifted to BDD a bit more heavily. Mm -hmm. oh, what would be the drawback of uh, that de developer only doing TDD and uh, uh, advocate that as uh, the full testing? Some, sometimes, let me give a little bit of context. Sometimes uh, there are companies that only have developers. They don't have QA. Sure. When That's talking cool. about testing, they refer back to, we do the TDD, and that's it. What, what is your opinion of that? How to, how to deal with this kind of situation? I go back to kind of the layers I talked about before. Um, testing units of code finds vulnerabilities in units of code. It doesn't find vulnerabilities in the components of the units put together. It doesn't find the integrations and things. So it's, it's a layered approach that you want to do. If your application is low risk, and actually the units of code is the actual only risk you've got, and a TDD only approach might well be applicable. I don't know many applications where it's the only level is yeah. unit test level. Um, I do think that testers can do development and developers can do testing. I think you'll find that developers are better at developing, testers are better at testing. Um, but as I said, back in the 50s, there wasn't a concept of um, developers, testers, things like that. You built and tested your own code. Um, and I'm not an advocate of getting rid of all testers. Definitely not, because I'm one. Um, 
but you'll see the value in testing can be throughout the entire stack, advising, influencing, pointing out risks, flaws. That's where there's a lot of things. I would say CDK is a great approach to build high quality code. Everywhere I've seen it try, it's very time consuming to do it well. And so most people have abandoned it. Yeah. Just did unit testing. Unit okay. testing are great at testing a unit of code. But I wouldn't trust them to test everything. Yeah, it's a mainly focus on the unity level. And uh, yeah, to, to approach it mainly from the risk point of view, which risk it actually cover. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, and you know, units of code. I've seen people write unit tests that are actually component tests and integration tests. Mm -hmm. So just because it's called a unit test doesn't mean that's what it's doing. And that's sometimes the challenge that language is often a barrier. So seeing it and talking about it is often quite good. You may find they're not just testing a unit of code, they're actually testing the integration layers between it and communication to the database and all sorts of different things. But they're just calling it a unit test because it's using a unit test framework. Yeah, that happens a lot. Thanks. Yeah. No worries. So I'll go back to the final slide then. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, all. Um, some really good questions there. Uh, Russell put on the spot, of course, but um, I think we expected that. Uh, so just really to, to wrap up, um, a few events coming up um, yeah, over the next few weeks. Um, so next week, the 30th, Sam Hogarth, um, Test Driven Solutions, uh, doing an introduction to example mapping. Then we've got on the 11th of August, which looks quite an interesting one, Kubernetes 101 with Chris Wraith. Um, and then thereafter, we've got workplace culture and COVID, which I think everyone, yeah, has, has quite a lot of experience um, off in the last kind of 15 months or so. So that'll be Paul Hand, who's also based in the Northeast, um, head of technology at DRS. So, um, so yeah, I think all that, that probably remains to be said now is uh, once again, if you've got any ideas for topic so if you'd like to speak do get in touch via the meetup page and um, of course any comments or any, any anything you think we can improve on and um, feel free as well to get in contact and um, yeah uh, I, I think lastly as well another um, quick thanks to our sponsor Segeza and um, yeah most importantly big big thanks to Russell for uh, for doing our inaugural talk and uh, yeah have a great day and we hope to, to see everyone again soon Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.